the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, German Armored Cars, Tactical Briefing, New Vehicles in Sky Guardians, and Metal Beasts, Unconventionally Quick British Tank. The new British MBT has already managed to take part in a recent triathlon and proved to be a worthy opponent to other tanks of this class. It's time to get a closer look at this gentleman. Please welcome the Challenger 2E. Its main caliber is a two-plane stabilized 120mm gun with elevation angles between minus 10 and plus 20 degrees. It's augmented by a coaxial and a pintle-mounted machine gun, as well as smoke launchers on the turret. The engine and the transmission compartment is in the rear, the driver sits in the front, and three other crew members are in the turret. It's no secret that British MBTs are traditionally unhurried. Centurions, Chieftains, Challengers, Modifications 1 and 2, all of them show inferior speed compared to most tanks of other nations. So it's pretty surprising when one member of this respectable family refuses to meet the expectations. Remember the racing Jordanian chieftain with a 1200 horsepower engine? Well, this metal beast is just as confident and ready to crush stereotypes. And to help it, there's a 1500 horsepower engine, similar to those found on competitors. The new Challenger can get to strategic positions faster, perform quick flanking attacks, and retreat in no time when necessary much like any contemporary main battle tank. However, as is the case with the Khalid, higher mobility and the new opportunities that come with it also expose vulnerabilities previously thought to be less glaring. For instance, the weak hull armor. This British tank feels more comfortable hiding the hull behind a hill and only exposing the sturdy turret rather than meeting the enemy up front in dynamic close-range combat. Its ammo rack doesn't help an aggressive style either, with only four shells in the first stage. To make things worse, once you spend it, the reload is slower than on the competitors, and it's pretty easy to miss in the heat of battle. As for the rest, this top British tank is a worthy opponent for other tanks of this rank. It has pretty much everything a picky player might want from an MBT. Great depression angles, shells with high penetration, various types of smokes, high-definition thermals, and commander controls. The only thing it lacks is a laser warning system, which would be quite handy at this rank since the skies are often shadowed by laser-guided munitions. The main takeaway, though, is that the new Challenger finally managed to lift Medusa's curse. German light-armored cars never truly became mass-produced. In total, 2,400 were made, but is that really a high number? The British Daimler numbers were over 9,000, and that was just a single type. Of course, the Germans did have something to be proud of. Their eight-wheelers and half-track trucks were true engineering masterpieces. The light-armored cars, however, looked pretty inferior in comparison, which might seem odd. Aren't Germans famous for making great cars after all? Let's go back to the early 1930s to find out what happened. Germany was rebuilding its army, and the army needed light trucks for reconnaissance and communication. They tried adding armor to regular cars at first, but with little success. Civilian chassis were clearly unfit for the task. The military wanted all-wheel drive, an independent suspension, and all-axle steering. A rear engine mount for a better field of view would also be nice. No civilian vehicles could meet such requirements, which meant a new one had to be designed from scratch. This was where the Hoch company received an order to design a standardized chassis. They chose a V-engine from the Model 108 that they were currently developing for the heart of the future car. It was placed in the rear, and the name of the project was reversed, turning 108 into 801. Not long after, an entire series of armored cars was built on this chassis. The first one in the line was SD KFZ 221, also known as the Leichter Panzerspielwagen. 
which is German for Light Armored Reconnaissance Vehicle. The production of the 221 began in 1935, and for that period, it was quite modern. The inclined, welded armor alone was nearly a breakthrough. Compare it to the clumsy Panar with all those rivets. Now the crew included two, the driver in the front part of the hull and the machine gunner in the turret. The turret was unconventional, by the way. The machine gun and the seat could rotate on a base attached to the chassis frame. The turret was also attached to that base, making a comfortable position. The gunner could quickly rotate the entire structure by planting their legs firmly into the floor. The next model was the 223. It received a wider hull and a new crew member, a radio operator. And the last model was the 222. It too had a wide hull with a two-seat turret armed with a 20mm autocannon. Moreover, there were a couple of radio modifications with no armament installed. A grand total of five models were built on this chassis. Doesn't sound like much, right? So what could go wrong? The Germans had a line of armored cars and even managed to standardize them, which was a rare success for the time. The problem was in the fact that each of those models was missing something. The 223 was good at radioing information, but only had a single machine gun as its main weapon. The 222 had a gun and could attack light armored vehicles, but lacked the radio. The 221 was simply too lacking, since its standard modification had neither a radio nor a gun. Its commander had to use flares to signal anything. And soon the war began, exposing all of these issues. The production of the 221 stopped in 1940, but later they received radios and light anti-tank squeeze bore guns instead of machine guns. The 222 got a radio and a stronger engine while its armor was thickened to 30 millimeters. The 223 received something to improve its firepower too, but no improvements could save them in the end. Light armored cars as a class of combat vehicle got outdated too quickly. They had inferior crossroad capabilities, they were too expensive and heavy as reconnaissance vehicles, and they couldn't even carry a good load of cargo or passengers by design. They simply didn't have any tasks left. Each game update brings with it some long-requested vehicles, but there's also a whole number of smaller changes that might go unnoticed or underappreciated by players. We wouldn't want this to happen, so let's go over some of the most notable changes introduced by the Sky Guardians update. We'll start with the locations. This time, our artists brought a whole lot of snow for three ground maps, Seversk, Arden, and the Maginot Line. Sometimes even small changes on familiar landscapes can become a good refreshment. Still, if you want to ban one of these locations from random battles, you won't see the winter version either. For our pilots, we've created the picturesque Pyrenees. This location was inspired by the ancient mountainous principality of Andorra. It features small settlements, medieval castles, and ancient monasteries scattered among endless hills with lush greenery. Watch out, though. The views seen from your trusty combat vehicle might be so mesmerizing you might miss the start of the battle. Now, all of the beauty of the Pyrenees aside, we have some vehicle news. What would a tactical briefing be without new custom loadout options? This time, your favorite mechanic was added to more than 30 planes and helicopters of various nations. Which of them do you think deserves its own section in the arsenal? Tell us in the comments. Meanwhile, we have more news about aviation armament. Incendiary pods have been added to a number of planes. Moreover, new big bombs have been added to the game. The new record for caliber is 12,000 pounds. We bet Fab 5000 fans are really happy right now. By the way, Thunder Show is looking forward to your new record set with this bomb. We've also added some auxiliary systems for modern aviation. For instance, there's a new ballistic computer for forward firing armament. On select planes, you'll now be able to see the lead required to hit a target within radar or optical system lock using your cannon. This mechanic is available both in third-person view and in the cockpit. You can also use it in any game mode. 
New audio effects deserve a mention, too. We've reworked sounds for automatic aircraft weaponry firing, ground vehicles hitting various surfaces, and buildings crashing on ground maps. The F-16 received unique sounds for engine nozzle opening and closing, while vertical takeoff and landing aircraft now have sounds for changing thrust vectors. A special mention goes to the new effect of abandoning top-tier aircraft. The ejection seat can now push the pilot away from the damaged vehicle in a split second. This animation introduces no changes to gameplay, but high rank battles have even more realism and atmosphere with them. We wish your pilots and aircraft a safe return from every battle. Meanwhile, it's time for us to answer some of your questions from the comments. The first question was sent by a player called Viract Prototypes. What's the difference between the SU-25 and the SU-25K? Hi there, Viract Prototypes. Besides camos and premium bonuses, the only difference between them is the countermeasure count. The regular version has twice as many, totaling 256 pieces. Silent Void 7097 asks, Why can't the Tornado have more missiles, like four instead of two? Hello, Silent Void. This limit was introduced by the designers. They might have thought that the strike modifications of the Tornado wouldn't need more than two missiles. Still, a recently added version of this interceptor can carry up to eight air-to-air -air missiles. Another question comes from Anakin La Chocolatine. If I keep one bomb on a wing, is rolling affected? Hello there, Anakin. Of course it is. The bigger the difference between wing loads, the more you'll feel it. Cam Go Re writes, Will we see more planes with fuel tanks? Hi, Cam. Indeed. Our work on drop tanks isn't finished. We'll be adding new aircraft with this mechanic and give older models a chance to fly longer as well. And the last comment for today was written by Cruz Busse. Out of all the variable geometry wing designed aircraft, what is the best for dogfighting? Hey, Cruz. We think you might mean the variable sweep, because wing geometry is changed by all mechanisms, including flaps, ailerons, interceptors, and so on. If that's what you mean, the variable sweep gives the biggest edge to the F-14 and the MiG-23. The mechanism was mostly meant to improve takeoff and landing performance, but improving lift in low-speed dogfights is also really good. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to try those big new bombs on a bunch of L3s, leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.